Good day and welcome to the Thomas Henley YouTube channel, your home for autism, mental health and self-improvement related content. And today we're going to be talking about creating your autistic sensory profile. This is part one of a two-part series on creating one sensory profile. And today we're going to be looking at understanding sensitivity and finding your autistic stims. So without further ado, let us get into the first slide. What are sensory differences? So medically, this is classified as sensory processing disorder, SPD. This is a medical terminology, medical language. Within the autistic community, the socio-political world of autism, a lot of advocates like to re-term pathologizing terms into something which is a little bit more neutral. Instead of SPD, people would characterize this as sensory differences because it's non-pathological. Non it's kind of in this neutral space and it should really be in this neutral space because it's not always a positive or a negative thing outright and it's very varied based on the individual. Sensory differences tend to come in one of two flavors, one being hypersensitivities, more sensitive, either being hyposensitivity, so insensitive or less sensitive. You can also be, in terms of your behaviours, a little bit more sensory seeking, so you seek out certain sensory stimuli, or you can be a lot more avoidant, so you can avoid a lot of sensory stimuli that a lot of people like. And I've just realised I've forgotten to turn my light on. There's a stick that on, it makes things look, look a little bit more nice and pretty. <laughs> but there is another term related to sensory differences, and that is sensory defensiveness. Basically, someone's predilection for only wanting sensory input when it's something that they want or, or, or as a result of an action that they do. So you might have a lot of circumstances where someone might be quite hypersensitive to light, but they might feel okay with switching light on if they're doing it themselves. Or perhaps you could take the example of music. It might not be the best to have a lot of music in like a busy sort of bar type venue, but when it comes to listening to your own music in your own ears, you may even have it a little bit louder than it was in the venue. But because it's something that you're wanting to do, it doesn't cause as much sensory overload, sort of overstimulation. And I do want to put a caveat here because some categories I don't particularly agree with in terms of placement. The sensory world, people's sensory world is, is very complicated and quite often it's not just one sense engaged in, in varying things. So like, for example, big one, oromotor stimulation, basically that sense of chewing that a lot of people like, a lot of autistic people need a lot of input in. Some people relate that to taste, which I don't agree with just because it's in the same area does not mean that it's the same thing and the actual mechanical tension the actual tension of your muscles is what's being worked in in the oromotor case rather than just tasting something where if you look at other resources about different sort of sensory sensitivities it might look a little bit different to mine so very apt for the topic of the video that we're talking about today why a sensory profile? Why is it important to have a sensory profile as an autistic or neurodivergent individual? Well, number one, it allows you to use the correct, useful sensory supports and make environmental adjustments that are good for you. Sensory supports being things that you use yourself to mitigate sensory stuff in the environment. So like ear defenders, noise cancelling, earplugs, sunglasses, things of that nature. And environmental adjustments being things that you could do at home or in the workplace that reduce the actual sources of sensory stimulation, which could cause anxiety if not fixed and may, after you fix them, provide a sense of calm, make you feel a lot more at ease and happy and less overstimulated in either the home or in the workplace. It also helps you understand which stims you might want to try, which can help with regulation a ton. And these tend to be things for me that are undersensitive, so hyposensitive. Things related to my vestibular, so my balance and my proprioception, so awareness of my body in space, tend to be things which regulate me a lot, as well as sort of blunt kind of deep pressure. And it could help you understand what could be your sources of sensory joy, because sensory joy is also another term that we tend to use in the autistic community to highlight 
the experiences of our sensory world that might be different, but also provide us a lot of pleasure. Add something beautiful and sort of nice to our lives that other people may not be able to experience to such an intensity. And it's also important for self-advocacy, because if you know what things really impact you negatively and what helps, you might be able to self-advocate for your needs a bit better in social and workplace contexts. I do want to highlight when it comes to the workplace context, be careful because although I would love to live in a world where disabled people could get the adjustments that they need, some people, when you ask for adjustments, can fire you. So be aware of this and do not take this as a, you know, this is Thomas saying do this and then get upset at Thomas because you asked for that. But I would hope that your workplace would be um, reasonable and nice enough to give you those adjustments, but we don't always live in the most happy and understanding world. Some people can be a bit nasty. So let us start our little exercise in creating your own sensory profile, trying to understand if you are hyper or hyposensitive to various sensory related things. We're trying to understand the differences that you may have. So we're going to look at each of the different senses and the signs that may give you a window into your own sensitivity. But it's worth highlighting that it's not always very easy to characterize as it can be quite complex person to person. Just for an example, I don't like white fluorescent bright lights quite often, but I do like colorful, glowy kind of flashing colorful lights. So it varies a lot from situation to situation and it's not always so clear cut, but in general, it could give you a better idea of your own sensitivities. So on the red side, is the hypersensity, hypersensity, is the hypo, hi <laughs> on the red or the left side is the hypersensitivity, so more sensitive, and on the blue side, on the right side, is hyposensitivity. Are you ready? Let's go for the first one, which is visual sensitivity. So on the left side we have, do you find that you squint, even in low lighting? You might find that even on overcast days when you go outside, you find yourself squinting and your eyes feel very, your eyes and the muscles around your eyes feel very sore. Most people's lighting preferences inside might be a little bit too bright. Their sort of level of light might be way too high for you. Does visual clutter and messiness get to you? It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be good at cleaning or anything like that, but, but if it does give you some semblance of stress just to have like a, a messy room or a messy place, more than how most people would react, could be a factor, possibly. A lot of people have that anyway. You could have fragmented or distorted vision when it comes to looking at things which are quite bright or just looking at things in general. And you might have a lot of detail focus on objects. Things might look a little bit more crisp. Although it's quite hard to compare that to other people's experiences because you can't use somebody else's eyes. Yes. On the other side, looking at the hyposensitivity, objects could be hard to see even in low lighting relatively to other people. You could have quite poor depth perception. So you might find that your depth perception is a little bit off. It's hard to like understand sort of how far things are away from you and, and such. You could have some blurred aspects of your vision in some areas which aren't related to your visual acuity or any other sort of eye related things. And visual clutter could be captivating or even quite pleasurable for you. It could just not bother you at all. And in fact, sort of be nice for you, be a, be a good source of input. You might have lots of art on your, your walls and a lot of various objects just dotted around all the place. You might find the idea of minimalism to be almost vomit inducing. <laughs> so that's the visual sensitivity. So if you have one of these, make sure to jot down which of these things make sense to you and put, put a little, give you a little point on the, on the visual side. Auditory sensitivity. For the hypersensitivity, noise seems to be magnified or distorted when compared to your peers. Even at sort of relatively normal volumes of music, it can sort of feel a little bit like the music's being sort of amplified or the atmosphere's being amplified in your brain and sort of distorted and 
all over the place. You could be very, very good at noticing small and distant sounds. You could have a really tough time cutting out background noise, which is quite common to a lot of autistic people, as we don't tend to sort of get used to our environment as much as non-autistic individuals might do. It's this idea of sort of habituation you might have heard of. You could get a lot of stress over stimulation in noisy environments. And you might find that you wear headphones or earphones 24 seven, just all the time. It's just something that you do. Just because you like music, of course, not because the world is noisy and all over the place. The other side, hyposensitivity. You don't hear things that other people can hear. It could be sort of related to your acuity, like picking up on different things. You enjoy making music or playing loud music. You might enjoy going to concerts or being out in busy, noisy places. Maybe not when it comes to like the busyness and like like people brushing up against you and stuff, but generally like the atmosphere is, is fine for you. And you could find that maybe sound, you know, your environment might not impact your concentration that much. So that's the auditory one. Let us go on to the olfactory, which is related to your sense of smell. The complex, jargonistic, scientific word, of course. I've got to go with that one. On the hypersensitive side, you might find that smells really bother you and can even make you feel sick quite easily compared to most people. And they, they, all of these are going to be, as you can see, quite relative to other people. And it's a bit hard because it's all very subjective. Avoiding people with strong perfumes and pets. Uh, you smell yourself easily. So if you haven't showered, you can you can smell that you haven't showered yourself. <laughs> So you can, have, you can have all sorts of smells going on there. You can't handle coffee shops, cigarette or hospital smells. It's fine that it's just way too much. You might even become nauseous when going into those places. On the other side, hyposensitivity. You might have no sense. You might be a nosmic. You might have a reduced sense of smell. You don't know when you smell or you need to shower. So a lot of people do like the scratch and sniff stuff, whatever they talk about. But that might be an issue. You might not know when you need to shower. You may use way too much cologne by accident, sort of overpower other people. You might find that strong smells like smoke or um, what's another strong smell? What are those sort of those sticks that you can burn? Um, it's incense. You might find that incense and or even gross things just don't bother you as much as other people. Gustatory sensitivity, again, with the jargonistic scientific terms, your sense of taste. Hypersensitivity. You may need to separate food from food items from each other. You might find that when they're in combination, those combination of flavors and even to some degree, the textures might just be a little bit too much for you. You may gravitate towards bland tasting foods quite often. Chicken nuggets being like the international sign of autism, of course. You might have a fairly restrictive diet. You may even have ARFID, which is avoidant restrictive food intake disorder that some autistic people can have make it very hard to sort of expand your diet, get all the nutrients that you need. You might find that you have a lot of safe foods. You may get overstimulated by, uh, you know, fairly complex meals with lots of different elements and sort of mashed together, or even hot and cold foods. On the other side, if you're hyposensitive, you might enjoy very strong flavors and very spicy things quite regularly. You may have tried to eat non-edible things as a kid, this idea of pika. And if you've heard it before, that could be a thing. And nothing is ever too sweet, sour or bitter. Everything is just kind of tolerable to you as compared to most people. Could be, a, could be a sign of gustatory hyposensitivity. Somatosensory came with the words uh, touch, basically. Touch hypersensitivity. Brushing by people in the street, in a busy place, gives you the shivers. Not in a good way. Not in the, like, those nice ASMR frizzins kind of feelings. Makes you kind of go... Ugh, oh, that wasn't nice. It felt like someone rubbing pear skin on my body. <laughs> my god. You could have issues with sand and dirt, sand and dirt, especially when it's like in between your feet or in between like crevices of your body. You could find that really, really overwhelming. You could have difficulties with the barbers or washing your hair. That could be something that you, you find hard. Issues with clothing and clothing tags. So if clothing's too tight or too loose or too rough and abrasive and the closing tags sort of feel like like little needles in the back of your neck that could be a sign of hypersensitivity could have issues with food texture and i did talk about this in the gustatory section but i think this is more related to somatosensory 
sometimes textures just don't really get on with us all these mushrooms tomatoes anything which has a variable degree of inconsistency when it comes to the texture you don't really know when you're biting into a tomato if it's going to be hard if it's going to be squishy if it's going to be you know cannot be fun also we have the hyposensitivity so you might find that you have a fairly high pain threshold could be a thing you might find that you tend to self harm during meltdowns or you might have had a history of that something that i've had you may engage in sort of harmful stimming sort of picking at things biting at things it might be quite regulatory to you although to most people it might be quite painful you might love weighted objects so you might just really 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 enjoy like having a weighted blanket or being like laid on or, or something like that laid on you might find that you feel lots of things you just have a tendency to just want to like touch things all the time i'm not talking about like in that way i know what you're thinking thinking like you know you go to a clothing shop and there's lots of nice little fluffy things everywhere and you just want to be like ah feel it all day lovely you love the super tight hugs you might find that really regulating you like getting muddy you like sort of getting wet as well from going in the pool i see you stop it and you may love tight clothing as well maybe something that regulates you quite a bit i do want to point out that this can differ a lot person to person and also between both acute sort of touch and blunt touch so soft and blunt touch might might be a bit different so for me when it comes to soft touch i'm very very hypersensitive like very very hypersensitive when it comes to blunt touch i'm very hyposensitive and there is actually a difference because there's lots of different nerves and stuff that go into our sense of touch and indeed like a lot of our different senses makes it very very complex to try and make a profile of course it's going to vary a lot person to person you're probably going to have to put some bullet points underneath your scores to a certain degree and again yes there's matter sensory caveats as i was talking about you have things like thermoception you know your perception of heat and, and cold you have nociception which is your perception of of pain that can be split into sharp and blunt pain mechanoception which is the main one that we usually talk about it could be both light medium and heavy they can all have different neural pathways in your body that sort of indicate varying degrees of sort of touch based input what about the vestibular aspects my favorite stim love spinning everything like that this is basically to do with your sense of balance so if you are hypersensitive you might find that you are very very sensitive to, to like travel sickness you might get sick a lot during long journeys you may hate not being upright or having feet off the ground so you might find that any sense of instability causes you to sort of freak out a little bit balance may be good or even exceptional to a certain degree it can also be bad because you may overcompensate as well in a sense and you may find that you really hate going on like park equipment or like theme park rides or anything that throws you about a lot or spins you you might just really find that very distressing what about the hyposensitive you might love to rock to swing and to spin something that i love this isn't this is my jam you know you love car and train journeys you look i like any journeys really that have a sense of movement to them it's very regulating to you you may enjoy theme park rides as i said uh spinning might be very pleasurable and not really that nauseating to you you may also find that you lose your balance a lot and you find that when you're walking you kind of do this this worm pattern that i've described before in a prior instagram post where basically you, you sort of try to walk in a straight line but you veer off to the side due to your insensitivity and then you compensate and you go the other way and you go further you sort of overcompensate and then you keep going back in this kind of wormy pattern as you're walking something that i've noticed it's not really something talked about in the clinical sense or even at all really very much but it's something that i've noticed for myself we also have the proprioceptive sensitivity which is going to be our last one on the list if you're hypersensitive you might find difficulty with fine motor skills so sort of anything that requires small sort of movements like things related to like arts and crafts and things like that you may like to hold your your body up in odd positions quite often you find yourself shifting into very contorted sort of positions to give yourself some some input maybe you may have a weak grasp on objects sort of not not be able to, to, to tell too much like what your body is doing and so 
You find that when you when you grab something, it like slips out your hands quite often. You might like to keep your distance from people when walking because you don't have much of a sense of the distance between yourself and, other, and another person. On the other side, the hyposensitive, you might find that you really, really enjoy chewy, hard foods and biting them a lot, like kind of oromotors sort of stimulation, which is kind of a little bit related to the somatosensory stuff. But that might be something that you that that you like. You may bump into things a lot, or people. As with the other side, you might try to keep you a, a large amount of distance between yourself and others. You may find that with hyposensitivity, you may you have too too close of a distance with things and people. So that's that's, that's kind of the thing related to like poor spatial awareness in relation to your own body. You might find that a sort of avoiding obstructions is quite hard. You might find yourself narrowly missing. You know, you turn a corner. You scrape your hand against the wall. That happens to me a lot. And you might injure yourself a lot, just tripping over, falling over, bumping into things. This idea of proprioception is best sort of understood as basically understanding where your hands might be if you close your eyes and sort of move it about. That is your proprioceptive sense. You may even find that if you are hyposensitive, I haven't put this on the list, but I think it's very relevant, that you kind of need to look down as you walk. Like you just need to... I think may, maybe proprioceptive, maybe vestibular. So if you have to look down in order to have that visual input to keep yourself sort of right and sort of not falling over and, and bumping into things. So that is the last thing on our list for the sensory profiling. Let's have a look at finalizing your results. So it's important to remember you don't have to identify everything on one side to be hypersensitive. And, you know, it's senses in general are very complex and sometimes situational and very individualistic. Each sense has all sorts of different inputs and they usually usually things that we experience in life are a combination of lots of different senses in one. But in general, using these as sort of a rough guide to get you to think about these things and consider whether you are hyper or hyposensitivity, hypersensitive rather, it can be quite helpful. You know, related to like fine motor skills in proprioception, because I'm very insensitive, I'm a very heavy handed person myself. But when it comes to gross motor skills, I'm not too bad because I've had a lot of practice sort of doing my taekwondo, doing my kicks, lifting weights. And so to some degree, there is an aspect of like learning skills and stuff, which can impact how good you are at sort of various skills related to those senses. So I'd recommend jotting down uh, what you think you are for each sense. And so let's try and focus today on the hyposensitivities. Due to the lack of stimulation that we experience in those hyposensitivities, we may find that adding in some stimulation to those senses might provide us a lot of useful input that might regulate us quite a bit. I definitely find this, as I said, the proprioceptive vestibular stuff very hypersensitive too. That means that I really, really enjoy any stims that relate to that. They really, really regulate me. I'm going to highlight in bold uh, discrete options for stimming because I do realize in a perfect world we'd be able to stim in whatever way suits us and, you know, just have a, have a grand old time doing, doing what helps us. But sadly, sometimes this world can be quite dangerous and people can make a lot of judgments. So I understand that. And so I've highlighted some of the more discreet ones just for anybody who is worried about that stuff. Stims for vision. These are just some ideas. They're not everything. You can you can think about these, you can have an idea, but maybe try these out and see if these work for you. Could be things like having flashing or colourful bedroom lights or disco bulbs, fairy lights, mirrors, spinning objects, kaleidoscopes, fibre optic lights, rainbow makers, galaxy lamps. All of those things might really, really help you. Flicking your fingers in front of your eyes, sometimes for autistic people that can be a really good source of sensory input. You could watch some satisfying videos or sort of moving objects that you see sort of on Instagram. You might already be doing that yourself because you're just naturally sort of drawn to that, but could be a thing to try. Uh, lava lamps, shiny objects, any any type of fluorescence, those, those might be things to try and check out. For addition, for hearing, it could be things like music or ASMR. Some people find ASMR very sort of relaxing, you get that experience of frizzens, that sort of tingling sort of sensation in your body. Some people like it, some people don't. I love it. It's great. Uh, verbal stimming, so it could be related to like making noises, humming, singing songs. White noise machines, that could be another thing, especially during sleep or just 
playing white noise in your ears while you're working or when you're out and about. Clicking, clapping, can be out in nature a lot, so listening to the, the beautiful world that we live in. Um, or by the water, I really like the sound of water, that's very regulating for me. Smell, uh, using or wearing essential oils or perfumes, could be an option for you. Using scented candles or aromatherapy at home. Could smell things around in nature. You could get some house plants, some very nice smelling house plants. Eating fragrant foods, so opting for things which are a little bit more spicy or sort of you know smelly in a good way. Using fragrant hygiene products or bath bombs. That could be something that you quite enjoy, sort of having a nice bath and getting a few smellies in there. You're probably doing it yourself if you like that. Spending time in the coffee shop. You could drink some herbal teas. You could get into doing cooking as a hobby. For taste, uh, all of these things, pretty discreet. <laughs> Got mints, chew chewing sort of juicy gum, hard sweets, sour fruits, mm, sour fruits. Eating me meals with lots of different flavors and items, sort of a kind of like a pick and mix mentality. You might find like a lot of Asian cuisine that sort of has different segments for like different parts of the food. You might find that to be quite Nice flavoured water or juice if you struggle with the hydration, that could be a good thing. And using chilli powder, of course, if you like the spicy stuff, but I imagine that you're already doing that if you like spice. Stims for touch, now this is a big list. A tight underclothing, so when I was in school I used to wear under armour, sort of the tight sort of undergarments that just squeeze my body to help me a lot. Um, that kind of deep pressure. Acupressure rings, these are absolutely amazing. I do have a lot of these things actually linked down in my bio if you want to go check out my Amazon storefront. A lot of these things are, are already on there if you want to go check them out. You don't have to get them from that place, but it does help me out. Do get a little bit of commission from them. Or soft clothes, you could get some soft clothing. Opt for comfort rather than style. Could use brushes, textured objects, putty, blue tack, sort of fiddling with it. Could have fans related to sort of firmer regulation. That's something that I really enjoy. Tiger balm, menthol balm. Rubber bands, sort of picking related toys, which sort of help sort of replace that kind of harmful stims that we might do to sort of stimulate our nociceptors, pain receptors. So for some people, it can be quite regulating. Probably good to try and opt for something that's not so sort of harmful to you. Iced, cold or hot and warm food or drink, depending on what you enjoy. Head scratches. Oh my God, I love those so much. Fidgets, spinners, hairbands, just like play with weighted items and blankets. Tapping and hugs. You might be a hugger. Ask for a tight hug from someone that you love. It's probably one of my regulating things that I enjoy doing socially. Sims for the vestibular. Things like trampolining, climbing, gymnastics. Could be going to theme parks if you can, if you've got the money for it and you can deal with the waiting. Uh, you could head tilt a lot, it's something that I do, just in general. My head's never on like a straight axis, it's always like a little bit, little one side or the other. Car journeys, that could be something that you enjoy. Spinning, park equipment, sensory swings, which I would really, really love something like that, but I don't have anywhere to put it. And wobble cushions for when you sort of sat at a desk. Proprioception, last one here. Things like flapping or rocking. Could be really good for you. You also get a bit of that touch input from that pressure on your ankles as you sort of rock. I really enjoy that. Uh, gym or sports, really, really big one for me. Weightlifting, massive source of proprioceptive input for me. Or Taekwondo or Muay Thai, any of those, they're really great. Sort of help regulate me a lot. Stretching, yoga. It could just be, it doesn't have to be proper like yoga stretches or anything. It could just be like, whoa, I'm gonna stretch my back off a little bit just now and again. That could be a good source of input for you. Could have under the table desk balance boards or rocking chairs again in my in my links down below. Chewables, gum, opting for crunchy and chewy foods. You could uh, try to tense and untense your muscles. Just to kind of, it's a very sort of anxiety reducing sort of practice that some people recommend. It's also good for proprioceptive and sort of touch-based input, pressure-based items, uh, which again is also touch-related, so weighted blankets, things like that. So what about hypers? What can you do with the hypersensitive aspect of it? We've looked at the sensory profile, we looked at possible stims that we can get from hyposensitivities. What do we do with the hypersensitive stuff? Well, you may find that 
hypersensitive things might still be quite regulatory. In my experience, hypos tend to be the ones which my body craves the most, but just because it's more sensitive doesn't mean that having that input doesn't regulate me. For example, music is a big one for me. Regulates me a ton, but I'm also very sensitive when it comes to my ears. You may experience sensory joy from these things, but not necessarily that regulation aspect to it. So that's an important sort of caveat there. And in the next video, the next part of this series, let's look at some effective sensory supports and adjustments that you can make for these hypersensitivities to make life just a little bit more tolerable, a bit more easy, perhaps increase productivity, perhaps just increase your overall sort of well-being as an autistic person. Anyway, I hope you found this helpful. And if you have, like and subscribe. Consider becoming a member for as little as 99p. You get a bunch of badges. You get a bunch of emojis. You get a sort of early access to videos that I put out alongside full uncut streams. And if I am live at the moment, please go ahead and join in and ask me a question say hi. I'm quite sort of approachable, easy to talk to, and we've got a lovely community already over there. Anyway, hope you have a great day, and I'll see you next time for part two.